Hello, guys. I'm very pleased that you are here with me. Uh, today, I would like to talk about how we can elevate and improve our software development teams with some unique approach with technical, but also with process and mental skills. Um, a few words about me. I'm working right now as an engineering manager and consultant at Amsterdam Standard. Uh, I have over 12 years of experience in IT. Uh, starting with the software development as a programmer, then moved to the uh, full-time being a mentor for uh, teaching programming. And it was very enlightenment experience in my life. Uh, I'm trying to be kind of local community engager. And uh, recently, um, I'm a huge IoT and web free enthusiast. So maybe you can see me in uh, another um, meetings and workshops here in Krakow community. So why I'm doing this presentation? Some time ago, we had situations like all software developers were doing code in the basements itself. And it was more normal for 30, 40 years ago that people were focusing as a one-man army to provide his idea, like, for example, Apple was created, Microsoft, Hewlett-Packard, and so on. And there was no need for like, a broad communication. Just it was so unique that it needs to be sold to the market, uh, try to empower others and try to find out a good solution because not many people had computers. Nonetheless, we have totally different times right now. We have a plenty of positions in IT that it's not only called as a software development. Uh, we have product owners, we have business analytics, quality assurance, view developers, backend developers, and so on. So we are facing totally different level of problems and, of course, opportunities with the communication, with what we want to uh, achieve as a team. The products are getting totally more complex than it used to be in the past. As you remember, one army couldn't be do uh, doing the project that right now, for example, 200 people are involved in. So that's why um, I prepared like, a short goal for this presentation. I know I have limited amount of time, and I would like to share with you to understand what happens possibly inside your teams. So just a question for you guys. How many of you are like on a leadership role, manager, or have some strategic thinking inside the company? OK, cool. So usually, uh, you may already face some issues inside your teams and uh, what's going to happen, try to, how to try to prevent it, and so on. Um, in our market, in IT, we have like, a huge issue with burned out factor. So I would also would like to address this uh, on, during this presentation and try to find a way how we can, how we can mitigate it. Um, as a developer also, I really like to sleep well during the night, and I really would like to share with you there some ideas that we can automate or do uh, inside our teams. And definitely, I would like to inspire you to know people better. As I said, like two years of experience being a mentor uh, gave me opportunity to understand how psychology and the human being is important in our IT market. So um, let's start why I even started all of this and started an investigation into these three topics. So uh, a couple of years ago, I was asked to start doing technical reviews. I don't know if, if any of you had opportunity to do some technical review, but usually it starts with you are getting the bench of code, and you are trying to find out if the product is OK -ish or it's like totally mad. And uh, it's, like, it's not going to waste uh, any time to, to get into the product itself. And it's also started the same way for me. So I started doing some technical review, finding the Git history, and so on. But then I realized we have totally different area of expertise to really understand the project and the people. And the, the process itself started being the more crucial factor for these projects and company that could be interest for us as an auditor, especially. So for example, I faced situation like one of the uh, .NET team, because I'm, I was mainly involved in the .NET environment, had like the newest framework. It was like .NET 6, so it was brilliant. It was like the cutting edge technology. But they were using like the Git email workflow. That I have no idea if you've heard of this. It was like doing the email for the all reviews and everything 
without GitHub sending e each email with their individual uh, process and so on. So it took even a couple of weeks to do very simple and straightforward tasks. Um, also, based on this experience, I also try to talk with the customers. So what we are doing in Amsterdam Standard with the new project, we are usually going to the new partner, and we are trying to find out, OK, even though I check the project, check the code, I would like to, and love to talk with other developers. And I really encourage you to do that, that if you are talking with these developers, they could give you like great hints and um, trying to find out their mentality, help you understand what's going to happen in the project. Because when you're asking a manager, everything is brilliant, everything is great. And then starting working with more developer-oriented mind, they will tell you that, yeah, we have the new .NET framework, but doing the simplest way is giving me for like a couple of weeks because we have this, and this, and this. And during this presentation, I would like to give you ideas how we can uh, improve it and how to prevent then cure uh, during your work as a leadership team. So we will start with the technical aspects, which are pretty obvious. Uh, but for me, one thing that mm, products are missing right now is to understand the scale. So for example, if we are like a software developer and we are doing very small amount of code, like one line that could improve, during the process at Agile, we totally do not have idea how much impact it would have on the project itself. So for example, we are fixing one line of code, one bug, and then we are not giving any idea of how much money we can save as a company or how much time we can save. So I really um, urge to think and communicate with the business itself that, OK, even if we are fixing one line of code, it, should be, it could be a huge leap for the whole organization. Investment in the future. So we are doing IT, so maybe majority of you think that we're doing cutting edge technologies. Uh, as the worldwide investment for the R&D says that between 2000 and 2001, there was like a worldwide 14.8 investment in the R&D. So this is like the small time for reflection for yourself if you really are doing some R&D inside your companies. Because usually, even though if we are using the new modern technology, sometimes we think that, uh, we are not having the proper R&D department. So for example, hackathons could give you a lot more benefit to understand what R&D could be and how to improve your company itself. That's technical depth is something that all developers and all business guys are aware of and they are afraid of. And for me, uh, technical depth is something that I'm used to it and that's something that's going to happen in every project. Because if you imagine that you are doing the newest JS framework on the market, probably in the next week there will be another one, so, but there is al already somebody who is working on the newer version that you are using in your, inside your project. So be aware that even starting the new framework, you're already having like a legacy, uh, legacy and technical depth. The problem is, how do you measure this technical depth? And for me, when I'm asking uh, IT teams and new projects, I'm asking about how you are dealing with technical depth. That's the most important part. So if you're a, like a developer and asking somebody, OK, if you're, uh, how, how do you go with the technical depth? Are you fixing it? Are you working with it? Uh, how you are like preparing because inside your team you can have like a Black Friday, let's say, and you need to push a lot to improve some and do some ugly stuff inside the code. How do you cope after it? So this is more important for me as a more like leadership perspective. How they are, we are doing technical depth, how we are measure it in terms of, of, for example, weeks, months, years, rather than if it exists or, or not. Um, there are couple of toolings that could be used inside your teams. Because right now, developer life is very noised by everything around it. So as a developer, you need to think that uh, your code should be, of course, secure. Your code should be quality oriented. Your code should be monitored because something could happen inside your company. And there is like a lot of things that needs to be uh, already discussed and prepared. And at the end, we are not having time for the real coding. Uh, 
So uh, that's why I encourage you to set up some tooling from the beginning. There are like a couple of, uh, of tools that we are using, uh, and they are like helping the, the IT teams. And the automation itself. The automation is already uh, talked like 20, 30 years ago. But I would like to show you the concept of, um, of uh, no-code um, tools. I don't know if you're familiar with no-code. Anybody here? I'll, OK, that's, that's great. Because I fell in love for the no-code two years ago. And before that, no-code was more about like, yeah, the shiny modules that could be drag and drop, but it won't replace the uh, one week of work for developer. It's obvious. It's, it won't. But for me, like the automation and using these no-code tools is great for having an MVP. So imagine if we have like a developer and you have a refinement, and you have like a plenty of ideas there that we should automate this, we should improve this, uh, and so on. And then somebody needs to pick it up as a developer and needs to fight this dragon uh, and need to find out the solution, how to properly do it. So as a manager and a, as a leadership, we, sh we can show people the tools that you can use. That, for example, this make tool that I'm presenting is able to do something in like a couple of minutes instead for like authorization for Google, uh, have communication with Notion, Gmail, and so on. Of course, it won't be the most optimized code, but if you want to advocate this, and if you're going to sell this for the team and the business, maybe it will be having the better outcome than like spending a couple of months working on something that is not giving any value for you or for the business itself. I couldn't uh, say anything about the AI. <laughs> in this year, it's like year of AI itself. So I'm presenting a list of tools that may be used inside your team. Uh, and uh, for, for me, AI, as I started dealing with it in November and so on, I need to have a disclaimer This AI tools is already with us for like at least a couple of years. And the technology itself behind it it's, was planned at 1970s. So we are getting more complex computers and more complex areas and domains. But the thinking and the tooling itself, it's right now as I'm treating it like an assistant for a developer. So for me, AI tools like the ChatGPT is like the modern rubber duck. Because if we are going to get stuck, <laughs> we are getting this beautiful rubber duck that you can find out on the, on the zone, and you can grab for it. But you can also right now ask ChatGPT, OK, I'm stuck. What possibly could happen? And usually, we can have like a colleague from the, from the company, which is great. But sometimes, uh, we don't want to bother anybody. And we, we want to find out by ourselves, OK, so what happened inside my code and how we can improve it. For the MVP state, it drastically improves our communication flow and so on. So for example, a friend of mine is using the chat GPT to soften like a passive aggressive communication with others. Because he finds out he has some problem with the communication. He gets feedbacks like that. And he is just asking ChatGPT, hey, could you rephrase some of the words to be more like formal, because we can communicate with others. Uh, and that could be a possible good idea to, to use ChatGPT. Also, simple code generation. Like we are dealing with the test, something that we are, as a dev, this is like tremendous job to do to generate unit tests. We need to cover it and so on. Let's do it with AI. It's not a very big deal. It won't be the very performant code, but it will satisfy the business needs. So that was about technical aspects. And now we are getting into more process that I hope it will be a bit more even interesting for you as you are more in the leadership. So when I'm starting doing auditing, auditing, the most important thing is how you're dealing with the deliver, delivery process itself. And when I hear that people are doing, yeah, sometimes we are doing the, uh, the deployment at the Friday evening, that's something that is killing in myself, uh, because I know how, what kind of implications they may have. So for example, one single developer is doing the release, and then what? Then we have like a dragons around it, and we need to uh, find out on Saturday what's going to happen in case of fire, for example. So all of this delivery process that needs to be really defined what we want to do, give you an overview as a leadership about, OK, what we are going to achieve and how we are going to do it. 
So asking yourself the delivery process, if it's automated, if, if it's done in a correct way, not over-engineered, what we want to have, will give you a good overview about your situation inside your teams. Growth mindset for people is that um, something that is one of the key factors for, for me as a, as a being more lead, that people who are having and getting the openness for changing uh, is one of the key value you may have inside your teams. So there is like an issue of the egg and the chicken, because sometimes I'm asking, okay, do you have times for experiments? And people are reacting like, yeah, we don't have time for experiments because we don't have time. And we don't have time because we are not experimenting at all. Uh, and starting the experiments, as for example, we have like a year of AI, that for me is like a must have to start. Uh, it's something that could encourage your people and find out new shiny technologies. Also, people, as IT people, they love to self-develop themselves. And uh, that's why uh, I, I believe that they need some time, and usually from my experience, teams that are having locate, allocated some time uh, for experiments and self-development are more happy in the terms of uh, time. So what you can do, you can spend, for example, like one day per month for the self-development. You can get people to the hackathon, uh, encourage them to go to, to the conference together, organize some workshop internally, that's what we are trying to do, spend a couple of days with them, have some reflection, uh, and try to encourage them to uh, get for the next step as a project because the outcome will be delivered. A couple of weeks ago, I did a presentation on four developers about sticking into the frame. And for me, Sticking into the frame is one of the most problematic things inside our market. Because I remember when um, I was uh, doing the, the auditors and going especially for customers to the, to the Netherlands, I started asking the questions, why they are doing this way and not another? And I realized that after being inside your team, for example, for like one, one year, five years, maybe 10 years, you are getting some habits that you are totally sticked inside the frame and you are not seeing what is happening around you. So maybe AI, maybe new technologies, maybe new frameworks are just waiting around the corner, but you are not seeing this potential. And usually, it's good to start asking the question, why you are doing this way? And the funny thing is that response usually is, we don't know. We just don't know we are doing this way, but we are already doing it for three years, so everybody are comfy with that. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, uh, I was, uh, sorry, one year ago I was in Amsterdam, and there was like a great presentation of Joel Peppard. He's an MIT professor, and he gave like presentation about there is time to get rid of the IT department. So, don't be worried, we will still have a job, probably. Uh, but what it means that we are getting more from the, our caves, our basements, to the more technical, more business-oriented people, to mitigate the number of proxies between us as more technical guys and also the uh, people who know what should be implemented. And if you think about it, it's already started shaping. I don't know. I don't know how many of you have heard about the event storming. Yeah, half of you. This is like a great communication tool that's already happened uh, and it was implemented in 2017 that's encouraged people not only from the technical point of view but also for like accountant, for domain expert to start communication on a very high level of abstraction and then allow understand more technical people what should be really implemented. So we are right now in a shaping uh, times for, for it. So we are going into, the, uh, we are going into this uh, more read of, of the IT department and getting into working together as like domain experts and a couple of IT people 
sticking together and delivering the business value for the company. Um, the interesting thing for the, uh, for the sticking in the frame, I encourage something called LDD, Lead Driven Development. So sometimes inside your teams, you may have situation that there is like a one shiny person who is leading everything. And it, of course, creates like a best factor, but you have to be cautious. Because situation like this, for me, a couple of times uh, happened inside the team, and at the end, the guy, the lead, was just quitted from the job. And the co whole company had huge issue to transform, because, for example, the person was an architect. And the person said, OK, we will uh, refactor everything like in two years. Don't worry. <laughs> it will be done. What could possibly go wrong? Uh, yeah, after two years, you can imagine that there was like nothing done. But the person itself was so, so much uh, aware of what the person is doing and has some communication skills that convince the business that the job will be done. And we, as a more like um, mental, let's say, or people-oriented people, people-oriented uh, people leadership, we know that situation like this may happen. And what could happen inside the team if we lose this person, and this person is not delivering the value itself? Speaking about the people and psychology, and for me, when I started dealing with more, especially uh, during the having the mentoring and working with like uh, students, I realizing that working with uh, shaping the IT teams without knowing the foundation of the psychology, how it works, uh, how we are behaving, it's like the same as programming, doing the code without knowing how the computer works. And of course, it could be done because you can do like two weeks boot camp or something like that, and uh, you would say, yeah. I know how to do JavaScript, <laughs> uh, and so on. But at the end, if you have like a broader knowledge about, for example, how the process, processor works, uh, RAM, memory, and so on, everything, you could be um, shaping definitely new level of the software. And the same is with like technical team. If you're going to gain this knowledge uh, about the people itself, you will be just better as a leadership. And the question is, OK, so how we can gain this knowledge? So what we started to do a couple of years ago, we started dealing with uh, more of tests. There are like a plenty of tests. So for example, like the uh, Gallup tests. I don't know if anyone heard about the Gallup itself. Yeah. And that give you like the, uh, some skills of your people that could be used inside your team. So for example, um, so some of us are more like futuristic. Some of us are more about uh, having more like stable work or more like about people oriented and so on. But the main aim is to give you overview about how people and their mindset could be beneficial for your team. Um, because if you start understanding their personalities and their superpowers, maybe you would be a totally different level of leader. Maybe you would start to ask people the right questions and try to delegate them to the fields they, they will be comfortable to do. There is also like the um, Belbin test, which is kind of a resource investigator. Uh, that's also a pretty, uh, pretty good tool to, to understand your people. Mm, MBTI, which is also kind of personal type, so this diagram uh, will show uh, sorry, here, I will show um, what kind of people you have inside your team. And it's not about the IT teams itself, but for example, uh, people in other domains are using it to get more about their employees and how they are, can use their skills to improve the business. Um, rise, rise motivation profile, I just uh, did it like a couple of days ago to understand what motivates me. <laughs> it was even funnier to understand what do not motivate me at all. Uh, so it's also good to know, OK, we know the key value of motivation. So if you understand the motivation for your employees, for your people, you will be better able to prepare some environment for them. So e let's imagine that from the uh, guy's motivation profile, you get an outcome that 
People are very family-oriented. You could do something with it. You could prepare some event, for example, together with their families, to understand how they behave, to be, become more happy inside uh, your team, and strengthen the relationships uh, around it. So uh, I really encourage you to, to make this uh, test and understand your people. One disclaimer here. It's good to have like this uh, test periodically, so every two, three years, for example, because in case of very serious situation in the people uh, situation of life, they may change. So for example, some disasters and so on, the temperament could be briefly changed. Uh, and what we, what we are trying to do in our company, we're trying to learn about ourselves, that's I would, I would start with, and then start uh, um, understanding the others, especially inside our teams. The next thing is about the Agile, and uh, everybody in IT are working with the Agile itself. But I don't know about you, but for me, maybe I've seen one or two projects in like more 12 years of experience that the Agile was done mostly right. And right now we are getting into the situation that the Agile is like a silver bullet for everything. We are doing like an Agile set, uh, because this is in the manifesto. In effect, last year, I decided to go into a professional Scrum Master program to get into it, get the certificate, get the manifesto. And after reading it a couple of times, I realized that manifesto is very generic. And the process of the Agile itself gives you like a great foundation to start, for example, the the green, uh, the green project and have some, uh, for example, time box, name of the meetings and so on, which is great because usually you have no idea how to do it. But some people are like over-engineering it and they are doing like, okay, we need this meeting because it's very valuable for us and the customer, we need to do this one. And it's not the way. The way it's to implement and make flexible Agile as possible, because the manifesto gives you this possibility. And uh, I urge you to, to read the manifesto a couple of times. It, of course, gives some frames, but usually it's more about how you implement it and getting the value for your projects. Speaking about meetings, uh, that's what I called kind of uh, one of the main diseases of our market, uh, especially during the, the, the COVID times, the meetings are, of course, important. But amount of the meetings is the, um, the key factor here. So uh, on the QR code, you have like a research that was made that for the big companies, it was like more than 500 people, you could even save $100 million per year with like the meetings reduction. So they uh, had like a survey and asked people about, okay, was the meeting important for you? Uh, and uh, if, if you can skip it or not. And like half of people said that they could totally remove it from, it from the calendar. <laughs> so if you can imagine what I'm trying to do inside my teams, it's like having a meeting for two or three per people, which are really, curious about the topic and then share the outcome of the meeting later on. Because if you can imagine that we have like a 10 people during the meeting, usually two people are involved in talk, and eight people are doing nothing or playing games, mobile games, I also encounter something like that. So some developers were like playing FIFA, and was this, okay. <laughs> Hearing everything was around, but only like two people were involved. So. If you're like a selling a meeting, if you're making a meeting, I'm trying to encourage you to shift a bit the mindset because saying, okay, let's have a meeting for 15 people is very innocent because this is like a very important topic for our whole company. We are, let's say, investigating the new framework change shift. And if you start talking about the meeting as an investment, so for example, yeah, I will need 15 developers per, per one hour, which is 15 hours and then try to see how much money it could cost the company, for example, you know, $100 uh, per, per hour. So we, if you start asking about, okay, you want to do meeting for uh, $1,500, 
and what should be the outcome. And if we start thinking about the investment and money, uh, I guarantee that the amount of the meetings will be definitely less inside your organization. For me, the best meeting is when I have like the frames for like one hour or half an hour, and it's ending in 10 minutes. For me, it's giving like a huge relief that, yeah, with this, this, this is the outcome, and I'm very happy about this meeting like this. If uh, people inside your company would be uh, not very into like uh, shrinking this kind of meeting, show them their, this report, I think they could be convinced. Mental aspects. The third factor that it's very often skipped in my experience, but at the end, fi I find out this is the most important. Because even though we have like situation that we have like very technical people skilled, we have like a great um, people from the market, they, they are doing the best technology, the best algor algorithm and so on. If we set up the great process, we have like not the we have like a flexible agile, but our people do not have the motivation itself, we will achieve nothing. And that's the thing that I've encountered in uh, being a, a mentor, that we had like a situation with one of the students that the guy was brilliant. But after six or seven months of like crunching, so they spent up to 15 hours per day with learning coding, uh, only coding, not like the studies, the physics, mathematics, only coding, the guy told me that, yeah, he's totally not motivated. He has totally no willingness to move into IT market because he, he gave up. And what happened after a couple of weeks, that guy stopped his um, being better and better. And uh, other people who were less experienced, less talented, let's say, they were able to gain to the same level than uh, he did. So I realized that the motivation, and I encourage you to start talking with your develop developers, uh, with your teammates, about, okay, what motivates you, and the process that the test could give you the answer is what really motivates them. Um, and it's worth pretty important to mention that the, the money itself, based on my experience, is something I call, this is like necessary, but not sufficient condition. So you need, of course, the good enough money, but if you're not doing, uh, like something that could motivate you, you are not getting from the bed, you won't be able to provide good quality code. It's also to see like a more bigger picture. So if people see like more mission uh, about what they are doing, they are definitely more motivated. The culture. Um, even though we are having like post pandemic right now, we started working remotely. And usually we are dealing with a lot of culture that from the beginning maybe we're not aware how many differences we may have from the beginning. So for example, we are, have like an, our mainly Polish bias. So we are mainly focusing on trusting each other. If we're asking somebody who, okay, let's deliver the release at the first day, remember, not Friday. Uh, usually they will be able to satisfy it and I will put a trust on the person itself. If the person would fail, but for example, ask for help, it will be still fine. But if the person would fail and will have totally no uh, asking for help, telling nothing, we will lose some trust in the person. And from my experience, the Polish people are mainly about the trust. Uh, I used to work with like uh, the UK people, U the US, also uh, Dutch people. And they have totally different bias uh, based on the culture. So it's good to put this on the table. So for example, if you're working with like remote teams and you have like a broad diversity, it's good to understand each better like, okay, we are having people from India, we are having people from the US. That's what may happen because of our communication. And you could be really amazed what could happen inside your team. <laughs> uh, that for example, my friend was like, passive aggressive, and he had no idea he is, but for other culture, he made seem like off court. Uh, I also had some experience with like India people, and uh, when they are usually saying, I will try, for them, it means no. 
uh, there is yeah there is like a LinkedIn uh, page. If, if you're gonna ask me later on, I can I can give you like a link. Uh, but awareness of the communication give us possibility to reduce stress with like some tension about the about the people and about teammates, and empower the trust. Um, the next thing is about the culture is making the people proud. And even though we are not doing like the, probably the SpaceX, the rockets, and the most shiny things, uh, we are trying to make them proud at least a little bit. And there are like a couple of factors we can do. So for example, if the domain is a bit boring, let's say, for, for some of us, we can try to change the process to be one of the top market. We can try to lose technology which is one of the most important because, I don't know, there is like a plenty of web-free speeches right now. So maybe we can try to find out how to adapt this technology to our project. So making people proud is usually one of the main factors, uh, despite of the money, which could motivate people and stay with us more time and reducing the burnout factor. So try to find out um, what motivates and how you can shape the communication inside your current teams to make people more proud. Do we have any fans of Heroes Free here? Do you remember this game? Yeah, that's, that's still on the market and there is like a tournaments. That's, that's, that's perfect. I really love it. I also had some presentation about the dragons and the Heroes Free and trying to implement this in IT world. And uh, I would like also only to tell that everybody has like a different habits, skills and experiences. And you can imagine what could happen inside your IT team if we choose, like in Heroes, the same castle? Let's imagine we are doing the castle, 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 uh, and we are gathering the same resources for everybody. So what could happen, for example, inside the game, the people will try to fight with themselves about the minings, about the resources, because I need this. And the same situation could happen inside your team, because, for example, if you're shaping it with like a couple of, I need five backend developers, specialized with, for example, Azure, what could happen? They will try start to fight with the tasks because they have like the skills and uh, experiences based on the same domain. So what? Uh, I suggest you to do, to try to diverse the um, skills of the people inside your team that everybody could grab something that the people is interested in. So for example, even if you need like a backend developer, maybe they have like a different specialization or different mindset that can be used later on inside your team. Hobby. I don't know how many of you knows what kind of hobby people you uh, are having inside your team. Try to ask yourself if you, if you know. I started doing some investigation and find out that people after hours, they're having like a great hobbies that you can use inside building IT teams. So for example, let's imagine that somebody's interested in like painting 3D models. Uh, usually the person would know how the plane is constructed. And this is like the perfect match, for example, for the software house to assign these people to the new project about the flies, planes, and so on. And that would be like a perfect match for these people. So for example, if they would be implementing even ERP system, but the domain would be about the planes, they would be more happy. If you're going to put the same person into financial world, they may not be so happy. So I encourage you to gain this knowledge and try to find out the adjustment how to uh, match these people with their after hours, um, uh, after hours skills and experiences with your own IT teams. And mental health at the end. Um, there is a lot to, talk, to, to say about the mental health. Of course, we need to be aware that it's important and I really don't want to talk about the work-life balance and so, so on. It's like a must-have right now. What I suggest you to do, try to do some workation. Last year, we went with like seven of uh, friends of mine who are in IT on Gran Canaria for one month. And we tried to do the work for like eight to, eight to five and then try to travel across the whole uh, island and find out uh, what we can gain from it. So 
if you have this opportunity to spend like a couple of weeks with your team on the different, totally different zone than, for example, Krakow or Warsaw, go abroad, it's pretty unique situation for you and for your team because you are getting each other, getting to know each other on a totally different level. You are gaining the trust, and uh, you are able to understand what's pretty valuable, for example, for them in terms of the hobby, in terms of the after hours, for example, their motivation and so on. Of course, yeah, it's not very easy peasy to get these people. Uh, so even like the seven of us would, uh, was pretty, uh, pretty uh, complex to achieve. Uh, but yeah, if you, if you have this opportunity, I really encourage you. And in the end, please remember, that you really need, with the mental health, start with yourself. Because the problem is that if you're going to lose your mental health, your people would see it, and they will definitely be biased by that. So it's the same like uh, emergency situations on the plane. We are putting a mask on ourselves at first, and then on other people. So please, Bear in mind that we are starting with about the mental health with ourselves. Summary, because I really would like to uh, leave you with some topics that you could potentially implement inside your team. So my recommendations for today. The question when we can start the, all the changes inside our teams. And it's the same like doing the investment. You are trying to do it and prepare from tomorrow, because of course today we need to rest a bit, and start to do it as a baby steps. You don't need to revolutionize all of IT team and have like uh, getting there and step over and say, okay, I was on the code Europe, let's rephrase everything we know. Definitely not, but my aim for today is to give you some ideas how you can adapt this based on my experience and my work during the IT. How do I know I'm doing the, the better job? So it's pretty simple and straightforward. Try to measure and monitor. And the same as doing the code, we had like a plenty of tools. The same we can do with the test. The same we can do with like some uh, service on the people. So you need to measure it and find out what's going to happen because it's even better to prevent than cure afterwards. Um, collect ideas like this. We have like a plenty of presentation, two days. Uh, I'm a huge fan. I'm very happy that we have offline session uh, that I meet with you, can I meet with you and try to encourage people to go into the sessions like this. They're like the strong representation on my right from my company. So I'm also pretty happy that they are here with me. And I'm really seeing that maybe one or two percent of the companies are willing, are willing to go to the conferences, workshops, and so on. Ask yourself why the situation like this is happening. How to encourage them. I hope you find out on this presentation some of the ideas that you can improve on a daily basis of their lives and yourself. Um, like I said, the, the frame is pretty dangerous situation. So if, if you are doing it for like one couple of years, it's pretty easy to be biased and the, the habit itself could be created that yeah, we are doing it because we have no idea why, but we are doing the stuff. And everything is fine. And there is nobody for arguing with us, not asking the right question. So we are doing our job and we will throw away the project after a couple of years. Doesn't matter, the business is going to be like that. <laughs> so uh, as a more leadership role and more strategic thinkers, I encourage you to try to find out and step over the frame, ask for help as the audits, we are doing the security audits, performance audits, but we haven't started doing some, um, let's say, big picture audits. So what I'm trying to do with our partners to talk, have some research, monitor, and find out the good solution, how we can cope with the current situation. Focus on mental and, and the habit factor. So this is, the, the funny story is that it's all starting with the technical aspect, but at the end of the day, if you don't have built like the good mental and habit, you at the end will be doomed. Because you need to know that 
all of this, this is like the foundation to create like a good process. And if we have like a good process, good motivation of people, they will find a way to do a proper code. They will find a way to improve like the query from five seconds to one, if they are motivated. If they are not motivated, if they are going to be the most brilliant developer, but they don't want to really wake up in the morning, they won't be able to achieve it. And try to start to understand people better and make them proud at the end of the day. Yeah, I know it's very complex. I know it's very sophisticated, especially in more not very fancy domain. But this is our duty to find out the shiny factor, try to communicate with them, and try to do, at the end of the day, the good work. Thank you very much. If you're going to have any question, please do. Instead, thank you for, for today. Mm -hmm.